it's not a surprise that we invited someone like Abigail Disney to speak to our students and to our faculty and staff and to the community. You know, I have to say that she really exemplifies, I think, the values that we have here at Cedar Crest. And so it brings me great pleasure that she's here not only to speak to you, uh, but to also receive an honorary degree from our college. So the first thing I'd like to do is to invite to the podium our provost, Dr. Elizabeth Mead, for the formal presentation of the degree. Madam President, I have the honor to present to you Abigail Disney, candidate for the honorary degree, Doctor of Humane Letters. Dr. Disney is an award-winning documentary filmmaker and philanthropist who embodies the type of leadership and commitment to making the world a better place we try to instill in every Cedar Crest College graduate. Her longtime passion for women's issues and peace building culminated in her first film, the acclaimed Pray the Devil Back to Hell, about the Liberian women who peacefully ended their country's 14-year civil war. The film premiered in 2008 at the Tribeca Film Festival, where it won the honor of Best Documentary. Dr. Disney served as the executive producer of the groundbreaking and award-winning PBS miniseries, Women, War, and Peace. This work has been hailed as the most comprehensive global media initiative ever mounted on the role of women in peace and conflict. And she co-founded the Daphne Foundation, which works with low-income communities in the five boroughs of New York. She established Peace is Loud, which amplifies women's voices for peace building using the power of media. And she is a member for the Global Fund for Women, the Roy Disney Family Foundation, the White House Project, and the Fund for the City of New York, as well as the advisory boards of a broad range of organizations working in the areas of poverty, women's issues, education, and the environment. A firm believer in the value of education, Abigail received her bachelor's degree from Yale University, her master's degree from Stanford University, and her doctorate from Columbia University. And tonight, Cedar Crest College will bestow an honorary doctor of humane letters. Therefore, by the authority granted by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania to the trustees of Cedar Crest College, and by them delegated to me, I award you the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters with all the rights, honors, and privileges thereto appertaining in token whereof I present you with this diploma. We at Cedar Crest College are proud of you and honored to count you among our distinguished alumni. Congratulations. Distracting. Thank you so much for this. I'm not joking when I say I'm humbled by it. I um, I, I really um, believe in a college like this one um, as one of the incredibly important assets that makes a country like ours great, and communities like these great. Um, and so I don't I don't come here with a with a lightness or any kind of sense of triviality, I am here with all of my heart, and I am grateful with all of my heart. Thank you so much for this. So um, I'm just going to talk to you, I guess, really about my journey. Um, I didn't prepare a lecture on paper, and that's not because I think I'm hot stuff, but because I think um, I'd like to tell the room I'm in, what the room I'm in 
you know, is asking for. So um, I didn't think it was a good idea to sit at my computer all alone and bang something out for just some non-specific people. And I have spent some time now with this community, and I had an extraordinary afternoon with some of the girls um, who asked me the kind of questions that you dream that girls ask <laughs> about being a good person in the world, about, there they are, um, <laughs> um, about you know how to hold on to who you are as a woman and lead in rooms full of people um, who don't necessarily understand you, the value of being a woman. Um, and uh, they were bright and receptive and ready to go. And I think you should be really proud of that. Um, so this is no ordinary place, and these are no ordinary people. And you should feel very honored to be part of this. My, yeah. So my own, own beginning was a lot like the girls I talked to today, um, insecure, uh, uncertain, not necessarily all that supported as a woman. Um, and not necessarily all that credited um, for my intellectual abilities or any of these other things. I was being groomed to grow up and get married and have babies like all the other women in my generation were um, in, in the kind of family I grew up in. Um, I also had this added weirdness of being related to um, quite a well-known person. <laughs> um, in fact, I, we called him Uncle Walt and so did all the whole rest of the country, which is really strange. <laughs> um, and there were beautiful, 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 wonderful bonuses to that. You know, I got to go in the back door at Disneyland, which is pretty awesome. And back in those days, um, Mickey Mouse, they had one Mickey Mouse at the park, and he was, um, he was a what vertically challenged gentleman. Um, <laughs> In, in his 50s, who had a big cigar habit and, and really, really, really was very inappropriate with Snow White. <laughs> and I remember the first time I ever met him, um, he came running up to my grandmother and said, Edna, Edna, so glad to see you. So now you know why the characters don't talk when they're in costume. <laughs> so, you know, I wouldn't trade that kind of thing for the world. That's a pretty lucky experience. And, uh, but, 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 um, you grow up with a name like this and uh, you do know that it enters every room before you do. Um, you do know that it creates in everybody you meet a series of preconceptions. They're different in every case. You have to suss them out. You have to hang back and see which pre preconceptions people are gonna have. Sometimes they're about money. Sometimes they're about that I'm gonna act like Kim Kardashian. <laughs> It's like, I wouldn't know how to act like Kim Kardashian. <laughs> um, and then there'd be a lot more sit-ups um, involved. Um, you know, or, or, or that I came from the happiest place on earth and everything is perfect all the time. Those are the three primary preconceptions I, I deal with. And, um, you know, I left Los Angeles. I went to college in the East Coast and I kind of settled in the East Coast, fell terribly in love with my, my very best friend and boyfriend in college, and we've been together for 33 years, and we settled in the East Coast. And um, I settled into my 20s, which were like a lot of people's 20s. I'm sure we all remember. Um, not really sure what I wanted to do. Not really sure how I wanted to do it. Pretty sure everybody had wronged me right up until that point, and it was everybody else's fault. Um, and really, really, really uncomfortable in my own skin really uncomfortable with the last name. Um, and there were various levels of that discomfort. One level of it had to do with it calling attention to me that I didn't appreciate and didn't really, hadn't asked for. Um, and that's kind of one of those things like, you know, having, I don't know, one leg or so. You don't, that's just life. Get over it. Um, um, but the other one was, it had to do with inequity. It had to do with um, that I hadn't done anything to deserve or earn any of the privileges I had, and yet I was wallowing in privilege. I was floating, I was walking around on a cloud of privileges I hadn't asked for, hadn't deserved. Um, and I could see around me as I looked around the city I was living in, I moved to New York in the 80s, um, that you know there were people with the opposite of those privileges that they hadn't asked for, hadn't done anything to deserve, just equally. 
Um, so that sort of was the beginning of my journey um, to where I am right now. Now, mind you, that was my 20s, and I didn't make my first film until my mid-40s, um, a ripe old age. Um, so it was, a, it was a bit of a long journey, and I needed uh, a lot of help and encouragement and friendship along the way. Um, but where it really started for me in a way that was quite um, significant was that um, I started some volunteering, and one thing led to another, and I met some interesting people, and um, someone invited me to go to this breakfast for something called the New York Women's Foundation. I'm sorry, I'm going to have to do this. <laughs> it's, I can feel it sliding off. Um, the New York Women's Foundation. Now, I was um, raised in a, in a household that did not use the F word, feminist, at all. <laughs> um, very suspicious of those ladies with their hairy armpits and everything else. And, um, and so I said to my friend, women, oh man, do I have to? That will be so boring and I don't want to go. And my friend said, you know, trust me, come with me to this. And I went. Um, now, I had been engaged in a little bit in politics and volunteerism and how to get people homeless into homes and, you know, how to take care of the hungry and the needy and so forth. Um, and I was pretty sure I knew what I was against. I could probably go on for hours to you about what I was against. I, I had no idea what I was for. And I went and I sat with those women. There were maybe about 5,000 women in this room. And they were every description, and they, this is the great thing about women, they can wear any color they want, they can wear flowers, and so a room full of women is always at least visually kind of more interesting. And there were these women who had a very sophisticated, very well articulated analysis of precisely what they were for. Um, and I had not had any idea up until then. Up until that point, I had been sold a bill of goods about feminists. You know, that they were humorless, they couldn't get a man, they were only um, reacting against things, they weren't that sophisticated, they weren't that smart. That was the bill of goods I'd been sold. And here I was in a room full of funny, smart, creative, intelligent women who had every idea of what it was they were moving toward. And my life was utterly altered. I signed up onto that board almost immediately. I started going to work in their meetings and on their allocations committee. I went out to the neighborhoods and I met the women who were in some of the most blighted neighborhoods you can possibly imagine. And in those blighted neighborhoods, with everything working against them, the HIV and poverty and police brutality, racism, no opportunity, no jobs, no education, they still got out of bed every morning and said, what am I going to do to the work, make the world a better place today? What am I going to do to lift up my community? How am I going to be a part of the answer and not part of the problem? And, and that was really the day I knew, uh, this is my team. This is the team I choose to be on. This is the team I choose to support. This is how I choose to be in my life. This is how I'm going to make things happen. So fast forward many years later. I had four kids along the way. I did a lot of work in neighborhoods. I started my own foundation. I spent a lot of time visiting people um, in low-income communities and learning about the work they did. Even when what I was doing was gender neutral, it tended to um, focus on women only because it was women doing the work. Um, and one day, uh, I got asked to join uh, a group of women who were going to Liberia. Um, now, this is really off the wall, but you have to understand that my youngest had started the first grade, so it felt a little bit less horrible to get on a plane and go to a faraway place. That I had wanted and wanted and wanted to do international work, but had really kind of forced myself to refuse every invitation up until that point because of the age of my kids. Um, and I was miserable uh, and unhappy because while I was connected with the wonderful people, I was not generating, I was reacting. It was everybody else's plan for me. It was everybody else's idea. Every room I walked into, I was the checkbook that was going to answer the problems. And I felt like I was kind of emptying out on the inside. So I had reached a kind of point where it wasn't taking me to a good place. And out of the blue, my friend said, let's go meet President Sirleaf in Liberia. And she invited me to go to delegation there. 
Well, Liberia in 2006 was about two months after the inauguration of the first orderly pres elected president since the end of a long, long civil war. There were bullet holes in everything. I mean, I'm telling you, I never had any idea how much suffering um, could be just evident in the architecture, in the streets, in, in the looks on people's faces. It was a shock. I had never seen anything like it in my life. Um, I had the great honor of meeting the president, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, the first duly elected woman head of state since Cleopatra in Africa, to give you a sense of perspective. Not that Cleopatra was elected. <laughs> Pretty sure that didn't happen that way. Um, <laughs> And uh, I just couldn't believe how amazing it was. One of the things that was so extraordinary was how, in spite of how foreign and strange it was, and it was foreign and strange, how familiar it felt at the same time. Every time I sat down in a meeting with some of these women, they would sit down and they would describe the job training program. They would describe about the housing tensions, the land tensions, the political tensions, the tensions around class and employment and so forth in not only the same general terms, but sometimes in the same vocabulary as the women that I had been working with in the community. And it was kind of amazing. And it, I started thinking to myself, there's something going on here. There's something that's been burbling under the surface. A connectedness and a well of understanding that passes international boundaries and passes race and nationality and ethnicity in a way that's really, really important. But the other thing I heard from these women was this story. And the story that they told me came to me in little fragments. Like somebody would just refer to it. They'd say, oh, well, we sat on the field for three years. And I would think, what? You sat on the field for three? What is that? You know, and then somebody else would say, and then when we picketed the president's office, and I was, what, what? And so it was a little bit like a jigsaw puzzle that didn't have all its pieces. And I started putting these pieces together and realizing that there was a really story, an incredible story, and something really amazing had happened there. So here's what happened in Liberia. 14 years of civil war. 50% of the women in the, in the country have been raped. It's three, a country of 3 million people, 250,000 people killed. A third of the country displaced. It is horrific, and there's no end in sight. So the Muslim women and the Christian women make a decision. They work out their differences, in spite of the fact they'd never worked together and didn't really trust each other much at all and they come to the field. They strip themselves of jewelry, hairstyle, everything that's an indicator of class or ethnicity. They want to be one community. And they wear white, which is um, mourning color in this part of Africa. And they stand on the field, they learn each other's prayers, and they sing, and they pray, and they fast every single day. And the president drives by them every single day on his way to work and they patiently sing, pray, and fast. And after about 20 days, they get him to agree to a meeting with them, even though he said he will kill his own mother if she protests. They say to the leader of the women, we'll meet with you if you bring 25 women, thinking 25 women won't be gutsy enough to show up for this meeting. They show up with 2,500 women. And they persuade him to go to the peace talks in Ghana. And in, then they go, to light, they go to Sierra Leone. They do the same thing. They persuade the rebels to go to the peace talks in Ghana. And then they follow everybody to Ghana. And for three weeks, they sit outside, they pray, they fast, they sing, they wear the white, they pressure, they pressure. Outside of the edges of the meeting, they're having meetings with guys after hours and so forth, saying, well, if you'll agree to this, they're doing this outside brokering. And when it finally breaks down in the way that things break down, sequester, hello, <laughs> they, they lost their temper. And they surround the building and they lock arms and they send a note inside saying, we're taking you all hostage for the women of Liberia. <laughs> and when the men flip out and send security to arrest them, the leader of the group, she said to me, she's, it's in the film, she said, they said they were arresting me for obstructing justice. And those words, obstructing justice, something just went off. And so I started to strip naked. <laughs> and the security refuses to arrest them. This is actually from the textbook on nonviolent resistance. You know, ask Martin Luther King, ask Indira Mahatma Gandhi. 
basically the low power group protests, protests, holds to the purity of their moral discourse in spite of the way it's dismissed and demeaned and told, they're told that it's stupid and silly and funny. They hold to the purity of that moral discourse and then something flips. Some person with power says, mm -mm, I'm not going with these guys anymore. And that was security. Once security had gone with the women, they had all the cards. And the women said, we give you two weeks to sign a peace agreement. And if you don't sign this peace agreement in two weeks, we're coming back with 10,000 women. And don't think we can't do it. And two weeks to a day later, they sign an agreement for peace, which holds to this day. That was 2003. This is 2013. 10 years of peace in Liberia because of what those women did. Well, I, I came home from that now knowing that story thinking, how did I not know this story? I mean, how is it possible that somewhere across the world somebody did this something so extraordinary and I don't know about it? I read the paper, I pay attention, I know people. How can I not know this story? And if I don't know this story, how many other stories don't I know? Not only from last week, but 500 years ago. And isn't this the way we get written out of history? Isn't that what it looks like? Isn't this why we have to pull poor Sacagawea back from the abyss, <laughs> right? Is we, this is what happens. And I thought the reason it was fragmented when I found it was this must be what something looks like right before it disappears. And I thought to myself, I've always told myself my job is to figure out how I'm uniquely placed on the planet and I just figured it out. I have a media family and I have an understanding of how media works and I can make this film and I can make sure people see it and we can stop this thing from happening. We can stop this story from disappearing. And not only would that be an act of proper respect and dignity for the amazing women who did this amazing thing and they were owed, if nothing else, they were owed the respect for what they did. But over and above that, what will it unlock in other people? knowing that the women in Liberia did this. Don't we always do things thinking we're the first ones who did it because of the way we're invisible through history? What might it lift up in other people? So we made Pray the Devil Back to Hell. We came out in 2008 at the Tribeca Film Festival. I had exactly zero expectation of success, but we won the festival, which was kind of awesome. Robert De Niro hugged me. <laughs> That was good. <laughs> Although I will say I went home from that night and um, got yelled out by my daughter because there was never any clean underwear in the house. <laughs> so, you know, so much for feeling good about myself. But, um, but there, there's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to right now pause and show you um, a little bit of, the, of what we've done. It's a little bit of Pray the Devil Back to Hell along with a couple other films that we've made since then. And I'm going to now, then after that, tell you the story of where this film has been and what it's done. So why don't you start the media? We live in fear. When I go out of the house in the morning, I say goodbye to my children and my family because I say that I never know whether I'm coming alive back home or not. If you look at the frontline discussion of force, the troops, the politics, the borders, the weapons, the armies, that is a men's story. How you actually exist and continue on living in war, that's a woman's story. That story has never been told. Uh, there are no front lines in the wars in today's world. The fact is, the primary victims are women and children. Civilians are not, quote, collateral damage, as we once called them, but really uh, very much in the center of the war zone. Women, although they are not necessarily the combatants, are often the victims. In contemporary wars, the tactic is killing or raping women. This is a very nasty weapon of war. It has probably become more dangerous to be a woman than a soldier in an armed conflict. Afghan women will be essential to this country's success. We will struggle. We cannot do anything alone. The world has to support us in this. This is not the first case where rape has been charged as a war crime, but it is the first case where rape has been charged as a crime against humanity. 
what we've done here today is to send out a signal to the world that we, the Liberian women in Ghana, we are tired of fighting the killing of our people. If I should get killed, just remember me that I was fighting for peace. Ultimately, it's going to take reconciliation among people in order to get societies that function and that women are treated with respect. That is what this century is going to be about. Okay, so Matt Damon hugged me too. <laughs> and I hugged him back. <laughs> so Pray the Devil Back to Hell came out in 2008. Um, and actually our first international screening outside of Tribeca was a screening that I had um, planned much earlier because I had been in Bosnia um, for unrelated reasons, and I'm the only person on the world who can say things like that, you know. Yeah, I was in Bosnia the other day. And, um, and I had told the women um, about the story of Pray the Devil Back to Hell, just as I told you, and they said, when you finish this film, you have to come, you have to bring this film. So our first international screening was in Srebrenica, where there had been a horrific, horrific massacre of Muslim men and boys where the women have moved back and are, you know, refusing to be silent about that massacre. Um, and we had a screening in the town hall with 50 Muslim, Muslim women and 50 Bosnian Serb women. Um, and when pray, the lights came up after pray was over, a really interesting thing happened. And this is the thing that happened in every single room whether it was here in the United States or in Palestine or in Tbilisi, Georgia or Cambodia or Delhi or Nepal, um, it happened exactly this way. So about 10 minutes would pass where the women were kind of re-traumatized and troubled, but it would transform into a discussion of, I recognize that woman. There's something really familiar about what happened here. That woman over there, she was like my sister. My cousin acted just like that. They recognized themselves in the film. And you know, and honestly, I kind of wasn't expecting that. I really thought they were going to say, why did you bring this film about Africa to us in Bosnia? There was nothing of that. They saw themselves all over this film. And about 15 or 20 minutes in, and I learned after 32 countries of showing this film around, that you can set your watch by this. One lady always stands up and always pushes her sleeves up when she says it, always, and says, that's what they did in Liberia, what are we going to do here today? And then from there would come this incredibly pragmatic discussion. Sometimes it went on for an hour. Sometimes it went on for three or four or five hours. Sometimes there was another meeting the next day. But it was always a very pragmatic political discussion about how to organize around the central defining problem that was facing the women in that community. Well, that Bosnia screening led to a screening in Peru for 300 indigenous women from all the way from Canada down to Punta Arenas to a screening in, in, in Kabul and a screening in Khartoum, and screening in Congo and so forth, where the same thing happened over and over and over again. And it was the most extraordinary thing. I felt like I was a midwife. You know, everywhere I went, this thing would get born and it was extraordinary and I would weep. I would just weep after these screenings. Except that I was partly weeping from sadness because I also know how these things work. If there isn't enough fuel under it, it's not going to go. And as good as the intentions are in that moment, you know, if somebody isn't there willing to really carry the water, if there isn't money, if they're not connected, if they don't know how to do it, it's going to die on the vine. And I thought, I'm trying to light a bonfire here, and I've just got this one match. And maybe if I had more matches. And that was where Women, War, and Peace came from. It came from the idea that you know, women recognize themselves in all of these different kinds of situations. They see themselves immediately, whether it's you know, a white black thing, or an Africa Europe thing, or ethnicity, or language, or religion, or any of these things. N women are not rewarded by the systems that remind us of all the reasons why we're different from each other. 
right? Women are not rewarded in those systems. And generally speaking, if you go directly to women and you don't go through gatekeepers, they don't spend a lot of time thinking about those systems for the most part. Um, and so we went back and thought about what is it that we can do to light with five matches instead of one? Now, this for the project of Women, War, and Peace, and this is to tell you there are no wasted moments in life. Way back in my 20s when I was writing my dissertation at Columbia and wasn't really sure what I wanted to do, weirdly, I wrote my dissertation on war novels. Um, and I, I honestly, at the time, could not have told you why I was doing that. I really don't. I didn't know anybody who'd served. I didn't really know much about war. Um, but I was really interested in a couple of things. I was really interested in the way that we culturally get um, the idea um, posited that there are only a limited number of ways to solve problems, and one of the easiest and quickest and most clear is violence. Um, we are really quick to resort to that as a problem solver. And we live in a culture that sentimentalizes, let's face it, romanticizes, sexualizes even violence. Um, and you know, it's very interesting that 80% of the media consumed around the world is generated in the United States. And the media that's generated inside the United States is saturated, saturated with this romance of solving problems with guns, with bullets, with fists, and so forth. It's very interesting that I travel all over the world and everywhere in the world I'll see some version of Mickey Mouse somewhere painted along the side of a thing and I've started collecting pictures of him. But the other thing I see everywhere I go is Rambo. And you know, it's funny, nobody's seen the movie Rambo, nobody knows what's in the movie Rambo, but everybody knows who Rambo is. Rambo is the essence of, of the most toxic image of how to solve problems. What was interesting to me about these war novels, if you read through the history uh, of American literature, is they never have women in them. They just never have women in them. Women are sort of there. They're sometimes prostitutes. They're the mother waving goodbye. They're the wife you're going to come home to. But generally speaking, there are no women in these landscapes. And what I started realizing was it's not that women aren't in these landscapes. They've been written out of these landscapes. You know, if, if Attila the Hun could rape and pillage his way across Europe, there are women in these landscapes. You know, if you could do house to house fighting, where'd those women go? There are women in these landscapes. What happened to them? Why have we written them out? And the more I can think about it, the more I think, well, you know, if you take that image of Rambo that everybody knows, with the sweaty whatever and the bandoleras and the gun and the sweatband and everything, if you just take that image, he looks pretty awesome, you know, macho and amazing. You just put a few women around him and maybe some children, he looks like a huge jerk, <laughs> right? Because he's like, what are you doing? Put that gun down. <laughs> so there's a reason we don't have women in these landscapes, because we cannot sustain the mythology and the sentimentality about violence if we add back into the equation everything that reminds us we're human, that reminds us we're vulnerable, right? Reminds us that talking is better than hitting. So we went back um, and we decided to resume, we re restore women to the narratives of, of war. They had been written out of it, and the project of Women, War, and Peace was to reassert their presence in the language, the mythology, and the accepted narratives of war. And that was the idea of it. So we did a film about Bosnia, which focuses on sexual violence, but really more about impunity and the pain that is created by impunity and the barriers to getting justice around sexual violence. Colombia, which is about displacement and land and resources and how important it is for people to stay on their land and the role women play in that process. Afghanistan, which is really about political processes and how do you get recognized instead of inside of political processes that have defined you out of existence or mattering. And of course, Pray the Devil Back to Hell played as part of that, and we did a fifth film that was a five-part series. Um, we've had them all dubbed. We had 13 million unique viewers, which was an incredible number for PBS. And uh, we've had it all dubbed into French and Spanish and Arabic. Um, and we're now taking them out to community-based organizations around the world um, to work with them around getting women to understand themselves in a, in a habitual way, you know, gathering, making a habit of gathering and thinking of yourself as a viable political actor in the public square. 
because how would our landscapes be transformed if that happened? What I get often when I do this is a kind of a pushback, which I understand. It's a very predictable and understandable pushback about the nature of the relationship with women and peace. You know, and, and we've all had mothers. We know they're not always nice, right? Um, women are not magic, magic, super nice, Glinda the Good Witch, perfect. Um, we, we, we know that when women have gotten power, actually the very few women that have had the summit of power in their governments have been in many ways some of the most belligerent people that you can imagine. Um, but you know, I figure you clamber to the top of a pile over a lifetime, you end up looking like the pile you clambered to the top of once you're there. So to some extent, it trumps gender if, in fact, what you've emerged through is as, is as um, patriarchal and as invested in militarism as, as something like, for instance, Great Britain was when Margaret Thatcher became the prime minister. But over and above that, there's something really important. You know, peace is not in the estrogen, and it's not in the Diet Coke, and it's not in the second X chromosome. Um, it's more of an associative relationship. There isn't a single culture on this earth, not one, where women haven't primarily been assigned the duties of getting the water, finding the food, educating the children, making sure the house is in order, um, getting the health care, taking care of the sick and the dying, taking care of the old, taking care of the traditional knowledge. Those are the things that, if you were put them under one file folder heading, would probably, you'd, the only word you could think of is life. <laughs> they do life, and they do it as their primary job in almost every place on Earth. And so if women have a special relationship to peace, it's because peace is the necessary precondition for them to succeed at what they do. Peace is something they can't do without. When we finished Pray the Devil Back to Hell, I was able to go back and have another off-camera interview with a guy who'd been one of the warlords in Liberia. And I said to him, look, I kind of don't understand. 50% of the women have been raped in this country. You obviously have no regard for their sexual self-determination or dignity. So how is it possible that one person threatening to strip naked could make such a difference? Why is that such a big deal? And he said to me, well, I mean, he looked at me like I was incredibly stupid. He said, they were our mothers. They were our mothers. And I thought, well, that's interesting. And then he said, he looked at me, like and he was really um, frustrated that I wasn't quite getting it. He said, you have to understand there wasn't one man in that room in that moment who didn't ask himself, what have I done to get us here? What have I done? And I thought to myself, like, what would a political culture be like if everyone in the room stopped once in a while and said, what have I done to get us to the sequester, to the fiscal cliff, to the healthcare debate? We all, in those political rooms where the, the um, conversation is about pragmatism and, and, and political reality, we all poo-poo a moral argument. We all dismiss it as, oh, don't get overly emotional. Don't be all hyperbolic, you know. Stop being hysterical. And those women were offered a place at the table at the beginning of those discussions and turned it down. And they turned it down for a reason. They knew that they would have to leave at the door that moral argument. To, to be taken seriously in that room, to have any kind of weight, they were going to have to leave that at the door. And they, were, they knew that this was the heart and soul of everything that gave them currency, and they were not abandoning that argument. So they stayed outside, and they chose to penetrate the walls of that room fully intact in their moral integrity and in the wholeness of their argument that was a heart argument. The people in the room, you know, we all wrap ourselves up in justifications. We all need to go to sleep at night, and we tell ourselves stories about why what we're doing is OK. You know, we all have those moments at 3 in the morning where we're talking ourselves into why it's all all right. And a guy like that, you know, a guy who supports Charles Taylor, who spends years supporting, you know, they're, they don't think of themselves as bad people. They're just kind of wrapped in this wadding of justifications. And that voice, that moral voice, penetrated all that wadding, got through to the center of who they were. And the way I think of it is, our mothers, 
if we're lucky, and we're not all this lucky, but most of us have been raised with that voice, that different, let's face it, different timbre, different tone, a woman's voice that says to you for the very first time, don't hit, share your toys, you're okay, I'm gonna take care of you, it's all right. We all have that, you know, and that is the essence of peace. That voice saying those things to us is the construction of peace. And I have begun to see that not only does a voice in a woman's timbre have a capacity to cut through the padding of justification that we all um, gather around us over a lifetime, um, but it's a memory in all of us. And if that is a construction of peace and it's a memory, perhaps peace is not some far distant impossible thing so far off in the imaginary future. Perhaps it's something we've all known at one time in our lives. Perhaps it's something we reach backward to and restore in our world. And that is why I think it is critical to hear and value and lift up these women's voices in these places where what we want to talk about is peace. And that is why it's so important in this country to hear these voices, because it's not a peaceful country. You know, regardless of your politics and how you understand why we went to Afghanistan, why we went to Iraq, we're the ones going. We pick up, we spend, 10 times more than the second place country in defense spending. We manufacture 65% of the small arms that are in use around the world. We are exporters of war. And within our own country, the way we handle each other, the way we discuss politics, certainly the way we resolve disputes, it's too violent. We don't live in a culture of peace. But it's possible to change cultures. It was possible for the Mothers Against Direct Driving to change our minds about the nature of drinking and getting behind the wheel of a car. It was possible for people to get through to us that smoking really wasn't a good thing. It's been possible to tell us that it's maybe a bad thing to beat your wife and not something that just happens in a marriage behind closed doors and a private issue. Ch cultures change. They change all the time because people choose to change them. And we can build a culture of peace in this country. So I came to the New York Women's Foundation breakfast so, so long ago, and I showed up there with a certain hostility to the idea of caring about women because I was saying to myself somewhat defensively, well, I care about everybody. I care about people. You know, I care about <laughs> the world. Um, and I realized that if what I cared about was the world, I'd care a lot about women because they bear the brunt of poverty Yes, that's really important, but they also step up in very disproportionate numbers to address poverty, to organize communities, to rebuild, to make things better. They just do. They, the numbers don't lie. And so I began to care about women. And as I cared more and more about women and traveled the world and saw what was happening, I had to care about peace. If I cared about women, I had to care about peace because they were getting targeted in wartime. They were bearing the brunt of what was happening. I never want to use the word women and children. Again, that expression drives me crazy because it's women and the children, elderly, disabled, and sick that rely on those women, who is, by the way, dancing backwards and in heels like Ginger Rogers, <laughs> to, to, to maintain their sustenance. So women are carrying the load. And if you care about women, you have to care about peace. And then the more I cared about peace, and the more I thought, this is how I want to spend my life, and this is how I want to build something in the world, the more I realized I had to care about women. Everything kept bringing me back to women. Because without a woman's voice, peace can never be a message that can break through the wadding. Peace can never be a message that can be transmitted in a way that will break through and remind us all who we are and what we were put on this planet to do. So I make my life be about women in peace um, because, as I say, peace is loud. Peace is a verb. Peace is a choice and a process and a thing that you choose and a thing that you make. And it's possible for all of us to choose to make our communities peaceful ones, ones that value the human dignity of every person in them, ones that resolve conflict, 
with conversations instead of fights. And I invite you all, probably already doing it, <laughs> um, to join because it's some of the most joyful and most fulfilling work that you can have in your life. Thank you so much. I'm going to invite uh, one of our distinguished faculty up, Suzanne Weaver, uh, who some of you know is, uh, has led our, essentially our social justice living learning community. Uh, was, was there <laughs> students are out there. <laughs> uh, this living learning community, these students live together, uh, take a course together, and then go work on a special project together around many of the issues that you heard about tonight. And they just got back from Costa Rica, which is why they're very happy about it. But um, Suzanne is going to manage our question and answer period, so we have a short period of time for that, because I know you have some wonderful questions for our alumna, <laughs> Abigail Disney. That's a great, that's a really important question. I don't know if everybody heard it, but what's to be done with this toxic media? I mean, it is a media that, um, a medium that, or a series of media that um, really feed on conflict. And there's a feedback loop happening where, I mean, actually I studied Jacobean dramas. <laughs> if you study Jacobean drama, at the beginning of the 17th century, somebody wrote a really violent play and that sold really well. So the next guy, you know, three people were killed in this place, so he killed four people, and more people came, so the next guy killed four people and gouged somebody's eyes out, and more people came. It's a feedback loop of violence. It's the way media comes together with the way we do business in, this, in any country um, that is incredibly toxic and problematic. So it's a really good question. I mean, I, the week before Women, War, and Peace came out, <laughs> um, Black Ops was released, and, and I just spent, I spent a whole day in bed thinking, why am I even trying, you know? <laughs> who, can, who can push back on this? But, you, you know, I, my mom always said, despair is for chickens. <laughs> um, I, I, somebody once said to me that if you want fewer weeds, then plant more flowers. So I think I want to plant flowers. I want to have, and there's also the the things you have and do, but there's also the things you influence. So I try to communicate about what I do as much as possible and be in the community of people who make media and influence as much as I can. And then I try to encourage other people to think of themselves as makers rather than just as consumers. I mean, I think that the only way to push back on this dynamic is to change our consuming patterns um, because the forces of the profit motive are so much larger than any of us can push back on. Well, you know, I'm on the Susan B. Anthony plan, <laughs> which is that, you know, she spent her entire life fighting for women to get the vote and never saw it happen, you know, but sh that's what she did. I don't think that any of us should be fighting for something that we're going to live to see because I think that's setting the bar too low. I really believe that. Um, and even in a little way selfish. Um, so I figure... I don't, I don't know what the time frame is. It's just like this big boulder. I'll put my shoulder to it with everybody else. We'll all give it the best push we can and trust that the next generation behind us will do the same. And if we kind of make communities of like-minded people around ourselves and we all push as hard as we can, we have to believe that, you know, that, that things will, the best we can do is move things in the right direction. I don't think there's a finish line.
Right, that's such a good question. Um, I was really proud to make Pray the Devil Back to Hell because these were Muslim and Christian women who were supported by their leaders in the church, their male leaders in the church, who worked out their differences um, and who agreed that there was more that they believed together than that separate them and chose to focus on that. Um, you know, it, it, religion can be part of the problem and it can be part of the answer. And we wanted to posit religion as, an, as a part of the answer. And um, because of that, actually, the film really resonated in very conservative communities, which normally don't really go to see documentaries because they tend to be lefty, progressive, pointy-headed NPR types. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I didn't want that. I really wanted to speak to people who didn't normally hear this. And, and uh, you know, it's so funny. When we opened at Tribeca and we watched it in front of an audience for the very first time, I'll never forget. It, you know, you watch a film differently when you watch it in front of an audience. You, suddenly you're seeing it through their eyes and seeing how the group experiences it. And I thought, I said to Jitty, my partner, oh my god, we made a Disney movie. <laughs> because it, that's kind of what it is. And uh, it's kind of nice to come full circle and feel really proud. Um, because I, I do believe that, you know, there are two faces in every faith tradition in the world. And there's the one that's consumed with the job of telling people who's going to hell and why. And then there's the other one that's about how, how do we get into heaven and how do we help each other? And I choose to focus on that one. You said you have four children. Do you, um, you say you have four children. Um, what sexes are they? And then how have you influenced them to make changes? Specifically, I'm thinking of women now being offered a chance to go into combat. Mm -hmm. How do you influence your children to say that that's not maybe the right role that women yeah. can be playing? Yeah. Oh, that's a complex series of questions, in fact. <laughs> um, I have four kids, two boys and two girls. Uh, my girls are 21 and 22. My boys are 17 and 13. And, um, m you know, much as I go around and tell people they have to be good people, I haven't done that in my home life because I actually think that you... Um, you can't, you know, um, what's the word, badger your kids um, in, into being good people. I always felt like, it, in, especially in parenting, it's more important who you are than in what you say or what you do. And so I always believed really firmly that if we just inhabit, you know, a certain kind of life for them, my husband included, um, that they would kind of Cut it. So I had my worries. When my girls were teenagers, I definitely had my worries. And I thought, oh, God, this is terrible. And uh, one of them wanted to be a model at one point. I was like, ah! <laughs> um, and it's really interesting. As my girls are now in their 20s, they have a reflex for justice. I can see it in them. So they still have a bit of a need to kind of push back and the purple hair and the tattoos and stuff. Oh my God, they're so weird. But um, <laughs> so, so they have their kind of reflex and that's fine. That's what they do. But it's really interesting when they see something's wrong, they don't know how to not step up and speak about it. Um, so they would vigorously deny that they're going to ever do anything around social justice, but I don't, I think they won't know how not to because it's a reflex for them. And I can see it emerging in my boys too. So I really feel like, you know, the gamble worked out. It seems really a bummer you gamble on your kids and you have no way of doing it over again if you did it wrong. <laughs> but they're turning out pretty good. <laughs> in terms of women in combat, um, I would just say that, uh, gosh, that's a hard, that's a hard one. Um, I, you know, I've come to this as, you know, I've got my whole peace on earth thing, and I was not expecting to encounter the stellar human beings that I've encountered in the U.S. military. I mean, we have, we have amazing, stunning human beings in our military. And I've been invited, I've addressed the entire class of 2013 at West Point, where the head of West Point introduced me by quoting paragraphs from a speech I gave about peace a few weeks before. So there is a discourse around peace uh, inside of our military that is in many ways more progressed um, and better developed than the one I'm hearing in the civilian world. Um, and at one point I was giving a talk um, about women, war, and peace, and I had a woman come up to me, I mean, gold 
you know, I don't know the tea leaves, gold <laughs> braids and obviously very important. It turned out she was a rear admiral with 30 plus years in the Navy. And she handed me a medal and she was crying. And she said, don't ever stop saying what you're saying. This is so important. She said, we're never going to fight the Battle of the Bulge again. War has changed. It's all asymmetrical. It's all counterterrorism. It's all a different world now. Tanks don't do it. You know, destroyers don't do it. You know, this world we live in now is about conflict prevention and conflict resolution, and women are the key to that. I, th I think we have time for one more question. One more question. Hey, hey. again. Um, earlier you were talking about how when you travel abroad there's this undercurrent of resentment um, because of what's known as like us being the great white hope. I was wondering how you deflected that when you went to these places and set yourself aside so you didn't present yourself as, as like that and that like you right. weren't like cooing at them like you said earlier. Right, 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 right. Um, yeah, there is this thing in the development world and in the foundation world where people kind of, they have a check they can write which is very helpful to people in the um, world of places where there's poverty and so forth, and not just in the developing world, but in the United States and across Europe too. And so we go there with all this uh, unintentional capacity to insult. And we often don't really go with a lot of regard for people's dignity. I mean, I, I keep thinking about how uncomfortable it makes people that Hugo Chavez was sending heating oil to the United States. And however uncomfortable that makes you, that's how everybody in the cargo feels right now. Um, so I, um, but I, you know, as powerful as that is, that, you know, way of doing development, it's kind of easy to diffuse. Um, because the minute people sense you're listening, they, it's all, everything drops. The minute they sense that you really have an interest in what they've got to say and you give them authority and you think of them as just as smart as you, all that goes away. What, it's very sad to me how easy it is to make it go away because that means no one's doing it. Um, but it, it's, it's actually not that hard. Thank you.